I've got Emily Hanlon here who is a clinical psychologist mm-hmm. and she is the playful psychologist. <laughs> I absolutely adore your brand name because I think that that is exactly what it should be about. Yeah. How do we engage with our little ones and really support them in the best way we know how and mm. that is through play. play. <laughs> <laughs> Now, obviously, we're about to enter the fourth term for those who have got kids at school. And for those that have got little ones starting school next year, you're probably thinking about all of those developmental milestones. Mm. And I know often we get really caught up in the younger years about what our little one's doing. But, yeah, I mean, are milestones something we should really be focusing on? I think unless a healthcare professional has told you to track developmental milestones, it's really not something that you need to be, you know, have a checklist and be ticking Mm. things off milestone windows are there as a guide you only have to look at some of the windows to realize that like they're so generic so for yes. example the the walking window is like nine to 18 months is considered normal that's a nine month window that's huge that when we're huge. talking about you know little kids so it's really important to just view those as a guide not to get too caught up on hitting those milestones before we get to school if there's something extremely pressing daycare is going to bring that up with you preschool is going to bring that up with you and if they start school and a teacher thinks they're a little bit behind they're going to let you know yeah that Mm. is so true and I think often yeah we need to have those conversations with the teachers without obviously overthinking Mm, things mm. Um, but like you say with the developmental milestones my little one didn't walk till she was well over two Mm. obviously um, ended up with a disability but that was something again that was flagged with the doctor the doctor was the one that said this is something we need to monitor yeah um so yeah I think it is such a varied totally everything it's so varied and each child is going to develop at their own pace those milestone you know windows yes they can be really really helpful in some aspects but they can be really anxiety provoking in others so if they are overtaking your life a little bit the best piece of advice would be to go see a pediatrician or go see a psychologist or an ot or a speechy whoever it may be um, and just get a bit of an indication of whether this is actually something you need to be spending so much energy on Mm -hmm. And for those that have had a daycare teacher or someone flag that there might be something, mm. you know, happening that maybe they should get some support on, where do we go? Like like you said, you know, paediatricians and all the rest, is the first point normally the GP or? I mean, the first point can be a GP, but a GP is just there as a general kind of medical guide, right? They're not going to have any expertise in the area of psychology speech or you know gross motor skills or anything like that their job is to offer you the referrals Mm. to go get the tailored support that you need a lot of people think that you need to see a pediatrician as your first point of call that can be really really helpful but it can also be really time consuming (laughs) i was gonna say time wasting (laughs) and also um not really feasible financially for a lot of families to spend four five hundred dollars on an appointment only then to be given a referral to go go somewhere else so if you want to see a psychologist an occupational therapist or a speech pathologist you don't actually need to see the paediatrician first. You can go by yourself. You can get a referral from your GP and that gives you like your Medicare rebate, but you don't have to see the GP first. And I think that is so very true because I can think about my own situation. Mm. It's the psychologist and the OT that I lean on the most yeah. for my three kids. There you and go. I think, you know, even with things like assessments, I know that they take so long to go through the other system, like you say, $500 an appointment, but there are clinics around that are doing the testing. A hundred percent. Yeah. And when it comes to assessments, again, a lot of the times the paediatrician doesn't actually do the assessments. Mm. They're there. They want to see the results and then make a decision based on the results that you've provided them from the speechy, the OT and the psychologist. There you go. Yeah. Oh. And I always say to people, get yourself on those wait lists. Even oh if you, get, you don't get turned off when you say hear that, you know, you've got to wait a little while because no. it's worth putting your name on the list. Yeah, just, on a few, yeah. really. <laughs> like just <laughs> spread them wide, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's sad. There's not enough out there. I know. So, yeah. Um, yes. And let's for a minute just wind it back. We've been talking obviously about developmental milestones and having all of this information Mm. as an expert yourself, as a psychologist, when you, you're a mum of two, Mm -hmm. how did you find the transition into motherhood, you know, expectation versus reality and having (laughs) having this wealth of knowledge? I found it really difficult, actually. Um, I think being a psychologist, people often think that that means that you've got all the, you know, information and all the resources at your disposable 
to raise these like perfectly well-rounded children and that's just quite frankly not the case um, I think as well when you have kids all that structure and routine and everything that you kind of know goes out the window and for me I have a very analytical mind um, I'm creative but I like my list I like my routine I like my structure and having a child really threw all that out the window for me so I found like going from zero to one that was a huge life change and I really, really, really struggled with it. Um, There's a lot of like anxiety as well about thinking that you should have all the answers when it comes to kids, especially because I'm a child psychologist Mm. Um, and just learning as I go. I think uh, being a psychologist and being a parent are very two very different roles even though they complement each other. Yeah, I can imagine that. Yeah. And I think, yeah, it, it can feel quite, yeah, you get hard on yourself oh, because so you hard, have these yeah. expectations. I know I used to make the excuse to everyone. I'd say, oh, I used to be very organised. Yeah. Then I had kids. <laughs> it's like those routines went out the window But very, that's very it. Fast. And I'd like be in the shops and if my oldest has like a little bit of a wobbly at the shops, I'm like, is anyone like people are going to think I can't <laughs> do my job? Yeah, I know. know yeah, <laughs> exactly. I'm like, is that what people are thinking? Oh my god! <laughs> and has it changed the way that you approach your work? Um, I guess in clinic, working with children, has it has your perspective changed a little bit? It has a little bit. I definitely still have the same approaches that I've always taken, but I do have a lot more empathy for parents and yes. now that I know exactly what they're going through. Um, I've got two now. I've got a five month old as well and just that juggle it's just constantly changing so I definitely have a bit more awareness I guess and understanding of what parents are going through and then that's I guess helped improve my clinical work and how I can support them moving forward yeah Yeah. so true I think it's the really practical stuff Mm. knowing what else is going on exactly exactly the obvious stuff yeah now with our little ones heading into school potentially Mm -hmm. next year I know a lot of us we so fixated on you know, can they write their name and can mm. they, you know, do their ABCs and their one to tens? But I mean, h- how should we be preparing them for school? Um, I think somewhere along the line, we've kind of lost sight of what it means to be a young yeah. child. Like we're so quick to make sure they know their numbers, their letters, they can write their name. And if they don't, but our best friend's kid can, then we think that there's something wrong. And that's just like school is the place where they learn their numbers and their letters and to read and write and that sort of stuff. They don't need to, if they can do that stuff before they start school, great, amazing, but it's not a prerequisite for starting school. I think the most important thing that a child can do is learn through play. That's their universal language. That's where all that beautifully enriched to learning actually takes place. Yes. Mm. And what are some of those uh, tools that you give people? Is it that they should be Um, just free play and diving in and being there with their kid? Is it more games where there's winning and losing? Mm. I mean, when you say play, is it just giving them the opportunity for open-ended play or is there some element of guiding them through? It can definitely be a bit of both. I think that open-ended play with like different types of resources in different environments can be really beautiful. And by different environments, I mean sometimes inside, sometimes in the backyard, at the beach, at the park, that sort of thing. So you don't always have to feel like you need to give them new things to play with sometimes it can be the same things that they use in different ways and um yeah that can be really beautiful to to see their imagination grow and then other times you may want to engage in like games as a family and and that winning and losing just naturally falls into play I don't think again unless a health professional has told you to work on something I don't think there's a specific way that you need to go about engaging in play I think all types of play with kids especially at that like preschool age are beautiful something that I've often heard from psychologists and other therapists is around the fact that sometimes our kids measure their self-worth based on what they think is important Mm. and often it's the parent that puts a lot of pressure on you need to know your readers Mm. or you need to know your maths or you need to be good at this or good at that is is that somewhat true yeah I definitely think so I think we're all guilty of it to some extent because we just want what's best for our children right Mm. so a really good example is my little one Luca he loves playing like loves being outside and loves building hates drawing Mm. just can't stand it he's just not interested in it and even his daycare teacher said to me at the end of the year all the kids are going to get a scrapbook and your child is going to be empty (laughs) because (laughs) he doesn't want to do any of it and they're not worried about it but for me I was like well we we need to get all the drawing materials (laughs) and start drawing every day at home then after like three days I was like what am I doing you know what I mean like he's happy he's developing I know he knows how to do it he just doesn't want want to to so I think it's a matter of sometimes yeah our own parental expectations we accidentally put them on our children Mm. um and then in turn it kind of just pushes them away a little bit more like they really didn't he didn't want to draw 
before I started trying to force him and now he really doesn't want to draw, you know what I mean? <laughs> but this is it. It can, it can work yeah, in the opposite totally. way. Yeah, totally. It's actually my daughter's um, very creative and she was, we were talking recently, she's been making stop motion videos. Oh, wow. Very cute. And I caught her actually this morning and she's sitting over here on the side. <laughs> She can't hear me. She has headphones on. She was saying uh, she was watching a documentary about a filmmaker that had made the Elemental film. Oh and yeah. She was so fascinated about by this guy that had you know as a kid always played around with the idea of flip books and animations, mm. but how his family thought that he needed to be studying something mm. else. And we were having that conversation about how I would always support her mm. in whatever she chooses to do and I would never put pressure on her to do something that she wasn't comfortable with. And she's so cute. She turned around. She said, I know, Mum. <laughs> oh, my God, that's so beautiful. But it starts early, doesn't it? Does. It? it does. It does. And I think, like, we definitely have come a long way. Like, I think one, two generations ago mm. that wasn't, yeah a train of parent thought it was no 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 no. you go to university and if yes. you don't go to university you fear of failure yes. and you know all this stuff yeah. and now I think we've really opened our parental eyes to going like there's nothing really defines success anymore mm. there's no real definition yes, of it exactly and yeah I think we are, yes I think it's an exciting time because we are really yeah what that looks like. exactly I mean I still have a hard time with report cards and you know there, there, there was a time actually in kindergarten and year one I didn't open them because mm. I thought no my kids function a little bit differently to the standardized system and mm. I, that's not the most important thing to me so mm. um yes it's good to get a gauge but I actually then build the relationship with the teacher and get feedback in other ways that's it them. it's just generic feedback really yeah. um those report cards so yeah if you do have a concern <laughs> go straight to the <laughs> horse's mouth and talk to them in person <laughs> exactly yeah. and I think the other thing I found really hard and again maybe it's just because I have children with additional needs it's the the whole award system oh. <laughs> It, I really struggled with that in yeah. the beginning because I wanted my kids to know that effort and them trying their hardest was all that I looked at yeah. and that one year they might have a teacher that sees things, mm. you know, the way that they do and they might get recognised but it's not going to happen all the time. All the time, that's it. Yeah, I, I don't even have school-age kids yet and I struggle with those systems. So, yes. I, yeah, I get it. Yeah, and I mm. think are we just – is it more about just supporting our kids and letting them know that, you know, it's about – effort and mm. I guess but, but then effort looks different to everyone as everyone well. yeah effort looks different to everyone and um effort is going to get you different results mm. as well some kids can put in 150 percent but they may not they still may not be able to achieve that you know like award at school or whatever yes. it is whereas one child might be able to put in 10 percent yeah. And get top of the class. Like so it's going to look so different. So it's just a real, it's always really important to focus on that individual. And if they're not getting those awards at school, well, how else can we show them how proud we are of them? And how else can we show them how proud they should be of themselves? Yes, exactly. Mm. Oh, I love that. And I guess that ties into values as mm. well. Um, I've been having these conversations a lot lately because yeah. I know some people do family rules and yeah. others do this, but you know, something we started when the kids started school was peak and pit of our day, that really open line of communication where we all can talk about things that we enjoyed in the day. And if there was anything that wasn't so great, let's talk about mm. it as a family and problem solve. But what we hadn't done is this whole value set up mm. as a family. And I feel like that's my next step. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. I think it's a really good idea because I think if we're not living in alignment with our values, you mm. kind of feel off balance. Mm. So sometimes it can be really clarifying to mm. kids to go, well, what do I value? Like, what does that mean? And, and how can I make sure that my behavior is in line with those values? Because that's when you feel really balanced and really fulfilled moving yes. forward. Yes, and that we can't have chocolate in our lunchbox like other families because they have different. <laughs> That's something mm. I deal with all the time. My God, my three-year-old came. I know well, I made the really rookie error of taking him to Coles with me. That's oh, what yes. happened. And he's like, my be like his best friend has chocolate biscuits in his lunchbox. Can you pack me chocolate biscuits? And I was like, No, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get out. <laughs> I get that the same. I want to cut like this kid. I, I know. Oh my God, it's here funny, we go. T said the other day, well, why don't you go back and tell such and such as mum that they can cut it like your sandwich? <laughs> That's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> we had a laugh. I thought, why am I trying to keep up with everybody else's lunch pots? Seriously, and, though. Oh, my gosh, it's so wild. Funny. I would love to touch on friendships a little bit mm. because I know that 
whether it's at daycare or it's in the playground mm. at school, it, often we put a lot of pressure on our kids that they need to make friends or they didn't play with anyone today. And I've t- spoken to other parents and that comes up a lot. That yeah. Our kids go home after a big day and say, I didn't play with anyone today. Mm. <laughs> it's really hard. It really is. And I think if you do have concerns as a parent, I think your first point of call is just uh, booking an appointment with your child's teacher and just seeing what's going on. Sometimes I didn't play with anyone today can mean a lot of different things. It can mean that no one was playing a game they wanted to play so they actively chose not to participate other times it can mean they were excluded so sometimes it's a matter of you getting to the bottom of what actually that means um and going okay well now that i have that information what can how can the school and and us as parents work together to best support the child Mm. is there a club they can join at lunchtime are there you know, options in the library where they're not necessarily alone, but they can do things with other kids. What are the options? And then going from there. Yeah. And I think often my kids would always spend times in the library. Mm. And when my son, who's a bit chatty in the background, when he was, um, <laughs> when he started school, he was always with his sister at lunchtime. And I thought, God, don't they have enough of time yeah, yeah, yeah. together at home? <laughs> Why are they doing this? But that was his comfort zone. Yeah. And I think it's only taken until now, you know, year one and year three for that to really flourish. And yeah. To find those little friendships. Totally. The dynamics in the play playground can be really confusing and playgrounds are overwhelming they're overstimulating there's like often 300 kids Mm. if it's raining they're under a tin roof (laughs) like there's a lot going on in the playground so again it's just a matter of going well like are they if they are isolating themselves why are they is it a sensory issue is it a friendship issue what's going on so I think when it comes to friendships saying oh there's friendship difficulties is not enough it's a matter of delving really deeply into it and going what does that friendship issue mean for my kid yeah and I think too as it gets older it just gets more complicated totally totally oh my god I don't envy that at all (laughs) it's the whole yeah there's a lot of emotion behind it oh yeah you know it's really hard as a parent not to want to jump in and fix everything totally and you you, you want to give them the or arm them with the skills to be yeah. able to stand up for themselves, but sometimes they don't always know how. And exactly. I've definitely found going to the teacher and, you know, asking for her support on yeah. some, you know, things has really, yeah, has really helped. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I must say something really sweet. There's a little girl that's best friends with my youngest daughter and she is very reserved, very shy. Whenever there's a piñata at a party, you know, she gets quite overwhelmed because oh. everyone's quite aggressive. And then I sort of say, can we all share them out, please? Yeah, yeah. And the mum said that, that they had a similar thing in the Easter egg hunt. So yeah. she said they actually got out in the backyard and were rehearsing it. Oh. They had practice runs of her being assertive and getting in there and diving for eggs. It's and so thought, beautiful. It is so gorgeous. But, you know, these simple little nuances, like for certain kids, yeah. these things feel huge. 100% huge. Yeah, what might be really easy for one kid takes another child's, like, all their mental strength yes. to get through. So, yeah, I'm always a big advocate for dealing with issues on an individual basis because even like a friendship issue for you and a friendship issue for me can have completely different roots. Yeah, absolutely. I think the most important thing is to, yeah, let your child know that they can come to you with anything. Anything. You want to be that parent that they come to if they're feeling a certain way and then you can find out the best way to support them. That's it, 100%. And sometimes what I find, I mean, you know, we are looking around at schools in the local area mm. perhaps or ones that, you know, uh, because your partner or yourself went there as mm. a child, there are many different reasons why you pick a school. But I guess that's not to say that that school's going to suit your child. No. I mean, how, how do you find the right environment? Yeah, I think that's a, it's a really good question because I think a lot of the time, you know, you choose a school and it's a potential school for your child and you go to that school and they interview you, right? They ask you all these questions. But at the end of the day, you as the parent mm. should be interviewing them yes. and making sure that they have all the resources and they have the capacity to be able to educate your child yes. and to be able to nurture your child's growth. Mm. So some my biggest piece of advice for parents is if you're going to schools, interview them. Go prepared with a list of questions that you can ask them. Ask to see their, mm. you know, their calm down room if they've got one. Ask to meet some of the support staff. Make sure that the environment is going to suit your child and we're not trying to like squish them into a mold that just isn't for them. Mm. And I think too, a lot of people think, oh, well, it's not working. We better, you know, mm. take them to another school and move them around, which can be disruptive, I'm sure. Mm. Um, do you think it's always good to go back in and, and, you know, troubleshoot with the teachers and really totally. see what, what they can do? Because 
I've learned that you have to advocate pretty hard for your kids. Gosh, yeah, you really do, especially when, you know, your child might have some learning difficulties or additional needs of any sort. Mm. So I think, yes, if you can troubleshoot and you can work with the school. Now, obviously, there are going to be times where it's just not got to part your ways and, yes. and that's okay. But, yeah, doing uh, you want to come to that decision knowing that you've tried everything yeah. to make it work because you don't want to leave a school and go, oh, but what if? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I definitely think troubleshooting everything first and then if all else fails, then you're not contractually obliged no. to the school. Exactly. Find what works. Yeah. And I think, too, I've also learnt that being friendly with the teachers, you know, they've got mm. a lot of pressure and a lot My of God. stress. Building a really strong relationship with them will yes. actually help you more in that situation. 100%. And I don't envy teachers at all. They they they're expected to do the job of like 600 different professions. Yeah. With, they're begging for training. Like, yes. Poor things. And, and, and a schooling system that hasn't changed for a gazillion Literally, years. that suits like literally no child. <laughs> like. You mentioned briefly calm down spaces in mm. classrooms, which is something that I need to go and ask. And, and, and I love that you mentioned with the questions because mm. I always end up in those meetings and I walk out and go, I yeah. I asked this or I wish I did this differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's a really great tip. Mm. But the sensory spaces, I mean, is it, yeah, is it something we should be asking for if we know that there's, you know, a concern with our child or are we teaching them coping mechanisms as well that they can use in the class? Well, I think it's a bit of both. Like, yes, you want to have, you, you want your child to be well equipped with a range of different strategies, right? So maybe there's little strategies that they can keep in their pocket or that, you know, don't take up much room or maybe it's a calm down or a fidget toy. Mm. In other times, like what a beautiful skill it is for a child to identify that they need a break put their hand up, request the break and take that break. Yes. That is the epitome yes. of emotional reg regulation, right? Yes. So why wouldn't we offer that exactly. to them? Why wouldn't we offer them a calm down room or a sensory space? That sensory space is going to look different for everyone. Now, I'm not saying that your child needs a sensory room that's completely off limits to every other child and that yeah. sort of thing. But you want to make sure that whatever is in that room is suitable to your child. So that it may be full of fidgets, but that might be good for the kid that sits yes. next to your little one, but not your little one. What works yeah. for your child and how can you work with the school to make sure that those materials are present? Are there. Interestingly, my daughter's psychologist was telling me, so I thought that when she became overwhelmed in our home environment, mm. it gets pretty loud. There's yeah. three of them and they're all quite... They have needs. Yeah. And um, she takes herself to the Lego room. Yeah. She's in there just building Lego quietly. But that takes a lot of brain work for her still. Mm. And apparently that's not what she needs. She needs more putty mm. and she wants other resources. And I had no idea. Yeah. So I think sometimes you're right. It's about finding and having a conversation mm. with them about what really helps them. Exactly. And sometimes it is a bit of trial and error and that's okay. Mm. We rarely get it right on the first go. So it's about going, okay, well, let's try this for a few weeks and then we'll reevaluate. Yeah. See if it works. And if it doesn't, let's try something else. Well, it's funny you say that my daughter the other day, she turned to me and I must have been getting a little bit stressed out with one of the kids. <laughs> and she said, um, do you find things? Oh, my gosh. Thing? It's like, okay, yep, good, good, good call. So you know, you need cute. to call me up every now and then. So I feel like you can get to a point where your kids are actually totally. helping you. I know. Them. I was really emotional the other day and my three-year-old came up to me and he gave me his, like, favourite, like, comforter toy and was like, Mum, when I'm feeling really worried, I take five deep breaths. And I was like, first of all, you've, you've never done that. But, like, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for listening to me when I tell you to do that. <laughs> We know that you're paying yeah. attention. <laughs> now do it when you're feeling upset. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. And what do you think, actually, talking about your two little ones, mm. to kind of finish up on, you know, how you implement the work that you do with your own family, what mm. are some of the, the strategies or things that you've implemented that you've had the most success with? For me, the biggest thing that I've always known that I want to do with my kids is introducing all that, like, emotional language really early. So we have a lot of books which – is probably a bit to do with the line of work I'm in as well. I've yeah. been very lucky to have access to a wide range of those types of resources. We've got lots of books on emotions. We always talk about emotions. We're very open about them. I don't hide the negative ones. If yeah. I'm feeling anxious, if I'm feeling worried mm. and my little one asks me what's going on, I let him know yes. because I think if I can show him that it's okay to feel those emotions, mm. he's going to know it's okay for him to feel that way too. Yes. So, yeah, we, we've never shied away from those conversations and it's something I've I've drilled from the age of zero. Yeah, which yeah. I think makes a difference if they can. Totally. I had um, two of my girls, they, they can express themselves. My son, um, <laughs> waiting for a piece <laughs> He sometimes finds it hard and I could tell he couldn't find the right words and mm. he would draw things on a piece of paper and then we'd have that conversation around, 
yeah, let's work through this. Is it mm. that you're feeling angry or jealous yep. or scared or, you know, there are so many different totally. things you have to dig from yep. to find out what actually is going on and then giving them that language so that That's they it. can share. Totally. And something I have also heard, correct me if I'm wrong, that we shouldn't blame our kids for our feelings. So you're making mm. me feel anxious or mm. you're making me feel sad. Yeah, because I think it's a really important to remember that we're the only person responsible for our own feelings. Someone can trigger that emotion in us, mm. but it's our feeling. our feeling. So I think that's really important. And it's important for kids not to feel like guilty for making us feel a certain way because mm. we don't want them to like shy away from who they are because of a reaction we are having. Mm, so true. Mm. You said the word shame. And I keep saying to my husband, that's one thing I want to focus on, no shame and guilt. Mm. And obviously school holidays, lots of iPad time. Yeah. I said, we're the ones that are setting the boundaries. We're the ones that are letting them use it. Mm. Don't come out and say, oh, they're on their phone or their iPad again, you know, Mm -mm. because, yeah, it just has such a negative impact. So, yeah, shame and guilt is a big no. Big no. (laughs) Yeah, that's it. Well, thank you so much. What a fabulous chat. I could talk to you all day. (laughs) Thanks for having me. I could ask you questions for my own benefit, (laughs) really. But I just love, yeah, I love the fact that there are so many different ways that we can start supporting our little ones, like Mm. you say, from zero, even if it is about using that language at home about emotions. Mm. So thank you so much, Emily. Thanks for having me.